and welcome to The Last Standee, a board game podcast coming to you from five exciting countries across Europe. I'm he- joined here today by Alexis. Hi, that's me. Alessio, you from five exciting countries across Europe. I'm he- joined here today by Alexis. Hi, that's me. Alessio. Stress of the deer. Audrey. Hey. David. Hey, hey. And I'm your host, Fen. Hello. Uh, we're going to be talking about a range of different topics across the hobby. Uh, we're going to be talking about a range of different topics across the hobby. But today, as always, we'll start with the standee catch up. So, who's had the most exciting thing happen that they want to talk about first? Me. Okay. I sold, I sold my kingdom death. Woo. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Congratulations. Money, money, money. F- freedom. <laughs> Liberating as, as you felt. Yeah, even more because now I have time to actually play other board games, and also like, uh, yeah, like some burden of responsibility was taken from my shoulders. I feel like because like I used to moderate the uh, the Reddit, the King- Kingdom Death subreddit, and things like that. So- More uh, storage space now as well. Yeah, yeah, a lot. And the money. And money. That they that already else. left. Yeah. Yeah, I can say, uh, as somebody who used to moderate uh, some of the Kingdom Death community, it is a heck of a load dealing with, um, with with that community sometimes. It was a relief when I stopped doing it. I mean, I met a lot of uh, amazing people, like mm-hmm. you got, you, your people here. Well, of course us people here. <laughs> of course we're amazing. Of course we are people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, that's true. Well, meanwhile here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, and that's true. Well, meanwhile here, I got a package this morning, which is more storage for my kingdom left miniature. So it's the opposite direction completely. <laughs> and that's cool. Yeah. What storage? Uh, I already had the Felder Felder uh, big two boxes, but I grabbed a 150 millimeters high cardboard box with trays to put inside. I u- I reused some of the trays that are in the big set, but the, um, not the specialized one because I don't have a second sun stalker, for instance. But the ones for standard miniatures, a big miniature and a small one that the big ones were completely overflowing my my storage. So. And I, of course, bought too many trays, so I have two that are outside of a box. But next time I need more, I will just buy a box and less trays. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got to say, I don't have a second Sunstalker either. Yeah, I'm, I'm very bad at buying storage. I always buy too much or not enough or not the right size. Or... But I keep doing it. Okay, meanwhile, my my, uh, my kid, uh, my young son, uh, got, got uh, in contact with kid in quarantine. Of uh, Luckily, he's, not, he's negative at uh, the, the, the first check, so he just needs to pass another check and he's okay. But uh, the whole family is quarantined with him. And uh, add to this that I was, for work reasons, I, f- I was working with a Japanese time bit on the crazed side today. I hope that everything goes well. Um, uh, not yeah. super great to have a, a kid in quarantine for COVID. Yeah, uh, I, I have what is called the thousand yard stare. <laughs> but you, you can keep cool because even if you talk with your hands, we won't see it. Uh, yeah, of course, of course, and uh, of course, you you could hear the kids screaming, me screaming, or both, so it's okay. Um, on my side, I've been. Um, it was my birthday last week. Happy birthday! Uh, <laughs> again. Yeah, happy birthday! Happy birthday! Uh, <laughs> Again. Yeah, happy birthday. Congratulations. Silent, Sorry, birthday. I, I was immediately going to say congratulations and happy birthday, and I failed to unmute myself. So <laughs> my dog just stared at me. Well, that's a trap. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, not, not too much in the um, in the board game side or anything. Uh, I mean, I've been... Yeah, not, not too much in the um, in the board game side or anything. Uh, I mean, I've been pretty busy. Uh, and I'm currently uh, to uh, to stay on the topic of uh, Audrey and um, and David. Uh, I've been waiting for my pinups to arrive for now almost a month uh, that they've been in the um, in the custom in the custom office. So I'm expecting everything to go really well. 
Yeah, I uh, I believe I just paid the customs on mine today. It seems to be about the right amount. Um, How much was it? If it's not uh, no, um, ooh, about nearly forty. Uh, nearly 400 kroner but 30 euros i okay. i always forget <laughs> I, I, to drop the zero so very it, it is, I, I have to deal with pounds dollars kroner and euros every day and i i constantly get the amounts wrong so uh so, yeah yeah around 40 yeah. euros total including handling fee a bit okay. less than that. yes Thanks. so <laughs> i i don't have to await i don't have to await the uh 300 euros uh, oh, custom okay. <laughs> i i wouldn't be paying that Oh, I, I wouldn't either. I d there's a pretty good chance that I might uh, send those peanut backs and ask for a refund, though, because I I don't think that uh, Adam handled it in any though, because I I don't think that uh, Adam handled it in any positive way, and I have less and less uh, excitement for those pinup every day. Uh, the the um, uh, my fondness of uh, Kingdom Death from uh, four years ago as uh, four years ago has melted a lot in the past uh, couple of years of public relations. It has been very difficult to sustain um, excitement and interest when, if you played a fair bit, the material is a little tired and rote now, and what we've had come out has been very small addition. Duration, the exploring of the, the puzzle pieces and discovering combos and stuff, but we're pretty dry at the well now. Um, yeah, I mean, in in four years there hasn't been much to to help that, and Adam's uh, behavior in those four years and the way that he, he handled this um, help. I'm I'm still very excited for the GC, but the the pinup now that I've just um, extraneous to the game have a lot less um, allure than they had uh, a few years ago. So I might um, ask for a refund or, or maybe just uh, sell them and, and um, ask for a refund or, or maybe just uh, sell them and, and keep uh, the ones that I like. But yeah. Yeah, I've already been uh, approached by a couple of people who are like, oh, I'm not sure if I want to have this. Are you interested? Because as a painter, I, I could probably paint and resell for extra value. I could probably paint and resell for extra value, but I've got to think whether I even want to be doing that when I've got um, I've got some Sankakushin models coming, you know, so I have to think about my time. Yeah, it takes some time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, so that just leaves me. Um, okay, uh, so that just leaves me, and um, I, well, uh, we just yesterday started uh, my group, my role playing group, started playing the Enemy Within campaign, which I have just, I, I love it to pieces, and it's been utter bedlam and mayhem, and they've not even gotten out the first location yet. That's where we were for the whole night. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's, I'm looking forward to it. It's been very role playing heavy, but I have an advantage in this campaign. I know it very well. This is the seventh time I've run this now, I think, um, and I, I never. And the updates for fourth edition have been phenomenal. They've expanded on everything. They've adjusted some of the like not so fleshed out areas. Um, so it's been wonderful. Yeah, uh, actually, I am uh, usually against modules for a role playing game for pen and paper role playing game, but this has been my favorite. Of course, I never played the uh, Mask of Nerlato Tap for Tulu, but uh, uh, actually, The Enemy Within uh, uh, has always been my favorite. I remember it reading uh, reading about it when it got translated in the I think in the early nineties in Italian. And since then, uh, my favorite. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, this is its third revision set since it's been first come out, um, and it's the best one yet. Absolutely fantastic. But also, uh, I I decided I've I've had a, a couple of messages of people saying how much they love the box opening, saying how much they love the box openings on the Patreon, and I've had uh, a request of like, would you do a box opening? And I'm like, no, hell no, I'm not going to be on camera ever again for the rest of my life if I can avoid it. I'm that camera shy. But I had a package arrive today, and I've got no clue what's in it. Uh, so I was just gonna dive in and and makes just just see what we've got 
um, it's quite large. So you're so. going to make an audio. I'm going to make an audio unboxing. I've opened it up already, <laughs> but I haven't taken any of the packaging off. Um, so I got a rough idea of what might be in here, but I'm not sure. So uh, anyway. Oh, the dog's not here. This, this you is go. experimental podcasting. Yes. We are making history here. Right. Uh, okay. Yes. This is the one I was thinking of. Um, we've got, ooh, we've got Welcome to the the, the Roll and Write game. Uh-huh. It is uh, along with um, the reusable mats. It's a roll and write. It's just a roll and write, and I'd rather have reusable if I could have the option, yeah. Um, and also on the roll and write section, uh, I've got, um, that's pretty clever. Um, Gantz Sean Clever. Yes. <laughs> but uh, uh, to go with um, uh, Copenhagen roll and write, I have as well. So Captain is Dead, which I've heard nothing but great things about. Yeah, actually, oh. cool. <laughs> I should try your roll and write. Uh, I feel someday. a bit sad about that. <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, and oh, we've got Concordia, Venus. Oh, okay, Concordia, you are a bit too late, maybe. Concordia, Venus, and some Concordia maps. Yeah. Oh, 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 quite a few. Quite. That's what was weighing so much in the box. Um, and then we've got the original Villainous, which is finally back in print in Sweden. I've had like Villainous for ages, but I've not been able to get the core game. Actually, I don't have the original. All of them, and I'm just waiting for the new one to come out because it's got um, uh, Gaston. Yep. 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 Uh, and uh, Dead of Winter. Ooh. Another old one. Yep. Oh. I have I have a fun anecdote about Dead of Winter, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, and uh, Dead of Winter. Ooh. Another old one. Yep. Oh. I have I have a fun anecdote about Den of Winter, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, go ahead. When I arrived in Italy uh, three, f four years ago now, uh, I initially didn't really speak the language, but I have a fun anecdote about Den of Winter, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, go ahead. When I arrived in Italy uh, three, f four years ago now, uh, I initially didn't really speak the language, but I learned fast. And I found a board gaming club there, and we went there in a board game cafe, and uh, we played with... A I had the, the event cards to read, and I could read it because I knew how to pronounce the thing, but I had no idea what I was telling. It was like, oh, yes, I am reading this, and I don't know what's happening. <laughs> yeah. It was fun. That is fun. I, I, I've owned the game for years, but I lost it when moving over to Sweden. Um, we finally get out of a proper lockdown. And last of all, I got Flamme Rouge. Oh, bikes. Yes. I've wanted a racing game for ages. I used to have Formula Day in the UK. Um, but I wanted something a bit lighter because, I don't know, <sighs> Formula Day at times. Uh, it, it's on it. Um, but the one moment I remember most of all that made me fall in love with, with it as a game, and now I'm talking myself into getting it again, is uh, we started a... We're playing ooh, eight people, drive racing in pairs, and my friend Adam, um, he, blew up his, he blew up his car on the first... Like, right at the start <laughs> of the race. Literally the first turn, he crashed into someone <laughs> and totaled his car. And we, we looked at this and went... Okay, like we're going to be here for like two, three hours. Um, should we restart? And we decided to restart. Should we restart? And we decided to restart. And Adam promptly blew up his car again in the first turn. And at which point we told him he would have to sit there because he's driving recklessly. Like <laughs> at that at that point, I was like, I I love this. Uh, if I remember correctly, I won with my racing partner Chris. Yeah, that's right. Maybe that's why I like um, racing games so much, you know, winners. So those are, those are a lot of games. Yeah, it's it's a lot of games, um, but this is like the, outside of Kickstarters. I'm waiting to arrive. This is basically the end of the games that I uh, I've had due to come. It's been a case of replacing play with because we're not allowed to gather in groups. Yeah, um, of course. Yeah. Um... For anybody that's uh, interested, I think that we talked about Flan Rouge in um, our Christmas episode. Mm. Rouge! We say Rouge! rouge. <laughs> I, I, I can't remember that far. It's a wonderfully light race. I can't remember that far. 
it's a wonderfully light racing game that's really full of a lot of ooh moments. So it's it's a good one. Uh, and uh, let, let's just close this um, box opening session with this. <laughs> There we are. That's, that's how well, that's, you know the well, segment's finished. Some ASMR for uh, our <laughs> listener. ASMR. Yep. Right. So we're all caught up. I think. Unless anyone have any last business. Yeah. To close up with the news. Close up with the news. Um, I just like to say that when this podcast will come out, there will still be one day left to the uh, "So You've Been Eaten" campaign. Um, that is currently uh, making, I think, a fifth of a million uh, euros on Kickstarter, and it seems to be going really well. It looks re- it looks really interesting. I think that there's a TTS demo. Uh, Fen, you you looked into that, right? Yeah, there is a demo. Yeah, um, and it's the, the it's worth stating that that like amount it's taken is very high because it's not an expensive Kickstarter to back. Yeah, thirty dollars, I think. Yeah, it, it's. Uh, I've not yet played the demo, but uh, since Fen recommended it, I can only say that it's probably a good game. Yeah, asymmetrical zero to two players, right? Yeah, <laughs> asymmetric <laughs> zero to two players is exactly how you describe it. Yeah. Yeah, super cool. Uh, speaking of Kickstarters, I think that when this podcast will come out, there will still a few uh, days to back Everdell, the, both the complete collection, which is getting a bit of beef on the internet because of the pricing, and uh, the new expansion for Everdell. And I think that John Company second edition about uh, the time we we published this podcast. Yeah, rah, 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 rah. How dare people who are just joining Everdell get a good deal? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, Everdell Base Game is always super cool. Mm. You don't uh, need to feel compelled to add expansions. It's uh, it's a good engine builder. Yeah, and yeah. very, very pretty and uh, relatively easy to get into. Yeah, so so the, the, this wraps up the new, sec- the new section for this episode, I think. Yes, yeah, we should get on with talking about games, 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 games. And I believe the uh, the person to lead us around on this uh, little exploration. I have my little uh, rule book of unlock in my hand, so I I have everything. What is unlock? I think many people today know what unlock is, as in it's a board game which contains escape room tip type like uh, stories, adventures. In each unlock. In each unlock box, there are three different scenarios and they're all featured with uh, with an image on the box. So you can see the global theme of each adventure on the box. The, and there is an extra few cards which are an intro scenario just to uh, familiarize yourself with the rules. Extra few cards which are an intro scenario just to uh, familiarize yourself with the rules. The art of Unlock is that every single adventure is contained in 60 cards. There is no exception that I know of, even in the Star Wars Unlock it's the same. And it's that I know of, even in the Star Wars Unlock it's the same. And it's like that, just 60 cards and an app on your phone. The app has to be there because some mechanics use the apps. There are different mechanisms in the unlock, so you rarely have to compare to an actual um, escape game. You mostly have to combine things to think how to do the right combinations, how to use the right item at the right place. So th- there is no really, yeah, the, you don't have the act of searching, even though you sometimes have to search for a specific card in your, don't get the feel of rummaging through drawers, etc. But that's obvious with a card game. You have different mechanisms in the unlock. The first one is to combine objects. So you have some items with a red a puzzle piece and other items with a blue puzzle piece. You have to combine them properly and to add their card numbers. So for instance, if you had the red 11 and the blue cards 35, you have to combine them to do 46 to have the resulting card. Search for it through the deck and then get it. That means you have solved this. There is another mechanism which is uh, discard cards. Generally, it's when you've used everything that you could get 
at that point you can discard it. But I, I think that's a clever mechanics because until you've exhausted all the possibilities that derive from a first card, you have to keep it in play. And I think that that goes against the risk of missing something, which is missing something, which is good because the, the idea is re really to, to find everything. I, I, I think it's a game that's not very punitive, in fact, because even when the time is off, you can still finish it and you will not have uh, a good grade, but that's not what's important. Whereas in a real escape game, a good grade, but that's not what's important. Whereas in a real escape game, at least the ones I've been to, when the timer is done, it's done, you have to get out because other people are coming next. So that's a bit for, for different reasons, but um, you will have some machines which are green cards. They have a um, you will have some machines which are green cards, they have a number, and for these you have to put their number in the phone app, that's where it's uh, it's useful. And then you will have lots of different things that are in machines. You can think uh, of them as mini games, basically. Uh, somewhere you will just have to enter a number, like you're facing a uh, digicode. Or some others where you have to link things. In the Star Wars there are... Uh, I think machines in the Star Wars Unlock games are really fun. The Unlock uh, Star Wars games is a bit less hard than others. Sometimes you will have to look uh, attentively on your cards with attention to which uh, makes you draw another card. And you can use the app to get um, hints. If you feel lost, you can use that and generally the hints really help you uh, know how to use a card. I think that uh, what's fun is that every has a specific mechanism. Uh, not to, I'm not going to go too deep into this and especially not to uh, spoil too much. But uh, for instance, one in the Unlock Mythic Adventure uh, box is the No Side Adventure, where you use, where you're playing as the Doctor No Side, uh, who has allows you to transfer your conscience into an animal. That's really the, the first or second card, so I'm not really spoiling much there. And you will have to take your phone, on which you have a, a pistol uh, button. And when you press the pistol button, you can aim on the animals which are on the other cards and shoot to transfer. That's a use of the app that's a bit different. And every single scenario that I had done so far really has that little thing different from others. Sometimes you have to really think outside of the box, like literally to 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 find what the, the specific what this is yeah actually th this game um a a lock is uh, uh well let me say i am a fan of the series because uh, i love puzzle puzzle games and escape rooms so uh i always play the, the i'm a, a long player of the other series which is basically by Inc. and Marcus Brand, and it's a cool series, and actually it, it was a bit ahead uh, at the beginning, because uh, the, the, actually all the all a game like this is, it boils down to the quality of the puzzles. If the puzzle is good, the game is good. Locke struggled a bit, because these mechanisms were always there, but they uh, bega began really using them to the fullest since I think really Mythic Adventures uh, is one of the first very super cool uh, boxes they made. Star Wars is another one. So I, they, they have gone a long way and it pays off because the, the mechanisms now do a lot for the game, for the immersion, for the quality of the experience and for the fun you have with the, the people you are playing with. So yeah, th that's a very big plus. Of course, I I'm not a fan of uh, an app, and an, an app forced to me uh, to play a game. But I, I have to say, it pays off. Yeah, but if an adventure uses the sound, you need it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, you you need it, and it's not a plus, but uh, it's worth it. Yeah, well, I mean, and exit, exit's more sort of physical. Uh, if I remember correctly, 
you're actually called upon when play and exit to cut pieces apart and do yeah. one time things and it's pretty much it, it comes under that um board games as a pizza as a consumable where effectively you're getting one experience i think unlock has a slight edge in that a slight edge in that you can play it and put it on the shelf and come back to it a few years later and maybe not remember everything that's going on exits very much you have the experience it's done for, for me, oh, you can sell and like yeah, oh, yeah, you can sell it or yeah. pass it on to someone else, which is a nice thing as well. Um, I would say I I think adjacent to this genre is a nice thing as well. Um, I would say I I think adjacent to this genre is my preferred, which is um the crime ones. So the Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, and, yeah. and um Chronicles of Crime, although uh, that uses an app and. And I think in some ways I and it uses a uses an app and and I think in some ways I and it uses a timer as well. And I kind of like that consulting detective is slower paced. It's also worth mentioning just came out, um, is it's very hard to get your hands on, is micro macro, which is again adjacent to this whole genre, uh, but it's crime based crime based and it's very visual still. There is a there is a problem with Micro Macro in that uh, it's a bit more limiting in the amount of players. Because out of un unlock, you can play at four and thinking, but Micro Macro is more searching and looking. So if you are four around the map, yeah, okay, that's good. But more kids, they're going to slap each other because I want to be <laughs> the one looking. Yeah, yeah. it will happen. Yeah, they, yeah, they've added a few extra puzzles on the website as well for it. And you can um, go and uh, play a demo um, online following around uh, one particular crime in the story to get an idea how Micro Macro plays. Story to get an idea how Micro Macro plays. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, like with all of these, once you're done, you're kind of you're done you know like sherlock holmes you sit there and you do the you 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 do all the reading in the newspaper you go to different locations you get to the end and holmes turns up and goes well actually you're not very not very good because i did it by this 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 and this illogical jump of logic and this and this and i scored this many points and you scored what how many you're pathetic and you feel like scotland yard in one of those novels <laughs> in contrast unlock and exit i feel let you you can you can feel smart you can make those jumps and those logic of these puzzles and unlock i feel is a bit more rooted in the like the puzzles are linked to where you are it feels a bit more like you're in there um whereas exit sometimes they're a bit more abstract uh could be because in the end all exit adventures look the same i think was the best one because it was a bit different because there were there was logical thinking when you have to decide who was the murderer but except of that yeah uh, you can abstract because the theme is just there to to, to make a setting for a game and just that yeah on 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 unlock we had a lot of hey i'm good moments but we also had a lot a lot of how did we th how did they think of that uh, specific enigma how did they oh actually actually th that is exit two uh, if you play exit i play the local uh, localized in italian uh, if the translation is poor like uh, the arctic base uh, which the, or the polar base i don't know what's the name in english but that one was translated so poorly that an enigma was that a puzzle was completely unsolvable because of the translation they added an article and it ruined the complete completely the schema oh the, uh, the same happened to a german version as well like i think we played my wife got a gift of exit i don't remember which which one it was but like there were like some puzzles which didn't make any sense at all like uh, there was like low logic to it it was completely random and we solved it to like a small part and uh, then we had to look at the solution and the solution was completely different like yeah and uh, and mind me exit is an excellent uh, escape room series i love it and i uh, i think i have all titles uh, except possibly the latest one which are not translated but i have to say unlock made rig improvements since the start and currently i think it's the le it's leading I mostly played the newer unlock, so I'm not able... I, well, actually, I think I played the first one uh, years ago at a gaming convention, and yeah, I was a bit meh. Easy, easy. And, 
and uh, I've gone back to it uh, recently, and yeah, it's good. And honestly, even the Star Wars one is is good. Uh, of course, it's a bit less hard than the other ones, but it's sold as uh, less harder than the other ones, so that's that's fine. And uh, it's all tied. Uh, it's all tied up in the universe, and I think that they did a good job of uh, making it seem a bit more action-oriented, in that you have a bit less uh, moments where you have to think hard about some things, but it's more, where do I go next about some things, but it's more, where do I go next? You, you can really choose a few things, and I think it's great. They really all have their own character yeah they exploited their own mechanics real good yeah i i played the um the print and play exit um the room with a um yeah a, not yeah, bad yeah. that one it, it, i i was actually a little frustrated because the sound portion used um, morse code but didn't <laughs> use the actual as, assigned things for the morse code so I spent a, a fair bit of time thinking I had the solution and it wasn't working right, only to later on discover that actually, Earth, but it was sort of like, what? But th- could, couldn't you have done something different than dots and dashes for your, um, yeah. <laughs> for, for, for your, for your mm-hmm. audio code? Um, yeah, we, we played one unlock that has uh, an audio code at some point and... Uh, um, an audio code that changes a tough and so we just couldn't solve that because we had forgotten to turn the audio until it was too late so now now we put the audio but for just a few a bit of ambient music meh. Uh, <laughs> i've uh i've played a bunch of um of unlock my i've uh very much enjoyed pretty much all of them the thing that i usually really like with them is that there's a lot of um card puzzle that requires you to superpose cards to have like different effects when you play with them and i think that um that's always fun to to find like a a, a card will be a sort of um of ruler for example that you can use to then measure another card and it gives you like a hint about uh what code to use or something like that yeah, or when you have to look at the backs of the cards. Yeah, that. Um, if you're th- talking about the one that I'm thinking, uh, that thing, uh, that one is really good. Uh, it's a it's a really fun ending. I'm not sure which one you're talking about. So, <laughs> uh, so, so small spoiler. So I'll probably uh, of, mute, of, of, of mute that games. in the uh, in the editing. But uh, I'm talking about the pirate adventure. I haven't done the pirate adventure. Okay, well then. Uh, there's something happening with, uh, with that. <laughs> well, um, since as, as all of you are quite experienced, uh, if you were going to recommend one particular unlock adventure or exit adventure, or even one of each, for those of you who played both, which one would you recommend? I I, I am for unlocks exit uh, murder at, at the Orient Express. Absolutely. Uh, I would say that... Um... For fans of Star Wars, yeah, the Unlock Star Wars is great, but I played uh, Epic, Mythic, and I bought Timeless Adventures, but I haven't played it. And I liked Epi- me, uh, Unlock Epic Adventures. The uh, Special Agent uh, Adventure is great. Uh, I'm going to recommend the um, uh, the Pirate Adventure from uh, Unlock. I think it's it's really good and fun. And I think that in the same boxes it comes with the uh, an underwater kind of um, uh, Captain Nemo inspired adventure that I also found pretty interesting because it had some uh, fun oxygen mechanics. Uh, the pirates, it's myst- I think it's mystery adventures. I see a I big so. octopi underwater, yeah. a haunted house, and a bo- boat with a parrot. Yeah, that's the, the one. Cover. So that's Mystery Adventures, the second unlock. All right, cool. Good, nobody's recommended the Sherlock Holmes one. Cause I, I haven't played it. I, I, well, regardless, I want to trash Sherlock Holmes this episode. I don't also have anything positive to say about him. Maybe in the future. <laughs> Maybe in the future. Uh, we, we, we will make uh, uh, investigative uh, games episode. Yeah, just to reiterate though, Sherlock Holmes Consultant Detective is a good game. It's just Sherlock Holmes. In that yeah, game it's sucks. a great game. Yeah. He, he's he's an ass. 
Yeah. The game is good, the personality is not. <laughs> it can leave a bad taste. He's an ass. Yeah. The game is good, the personality is not. <laughs> it can leave a bad taste at the end. Uh, yeah, but fantastic. Right. Okay, so we're going to move on now from one type of adventure to a more kind of uh, standard board game adventure. We're going to be looking at Struins of Arnak, uh, which is a, well, it's a 2020 release. It's a one to four player game where you are all uh, archaeologists on an uncharted island in a mysterious sea, ocean, um, uncovering the remains of an ancient civilization. A very, uh, it's, it's one of the hotness. So um, I'm going to take the lead on just explaining this game. And in essence, it is, as I said, the two systems bolted together. First of all, I gotta say, I appreciate the theme here. I like this genre of um, archaeos, which is the bees, or to be give its proper name, Thebes. So in Thebes, you're literally doing real history where you go to various cultures across in Europe, and you uh, pilfer all of the archaeological finds, and then take them back to London, or Moscow, or Europe, and you uh, pilfer all of the archaeological finds and then take them back to London or Moscow or Berlin and stick them on display. And that's kind of, we're still suffering repercussions of that culturally, of this appropriation. And the British Museum is still going, well, and stick them on display. And that's kind of, we're still suffering repercussions of that culturally, of this appropriation. And the British Museum is still going, well, we're not handing anything back. Um, I think setting this all in a fantasy setting is a good move because you can have the joy of archaeology without worrying about the trap, which is fun. The game itself takes place. There are three main ways that you can score points. You're either going to digs, you are getting cards, or you're investigating up a, a track. I'm going to give a brief outline of each because there are some... Um, Rather than you put your little Indiana Jones shaped fedora wearing um, archaeologist on the space and you get to have some resources. As an aside, a chap uh, I know, know who used to live in Cardiff, where I lived there, um, Sam, is an archaeologist and he confirmed that generally every single archaeologist, when they're staring out across the dig, they ate snakes. They, <laughs> always. They, they will always do it. At least the British ones will. <laughs> so uh, that's that's a thing. That's a trope that they do. Um, the dig sites, those first dig sites, nice and easy to get to. They just cost foot points, which is discarded. Those first dig sites, nice and easy to get to. They just cost foot points, which is discarding a card. Um, Every single card has a different transport type on it, and it can be used for lower tiers. So foot is the basic one. You can either get two coins, two compasses, and oh boy, do these expeditions go through a ton of compasses. Of compasses. I feel like they, they're being a bit frivolous with them because they seem to just throw them away left, right, and center. Like, hey, let's go to this dig site. I need three compasses, and I've lost them all. Yeah, so uh, you get the coins and compasses, or you can get two tablets or one arrowhead, or you can discard an extra card, play an extra, play an extra card to get a red gem. That kind of gives you the um, the idea of the tiers of how rare the resources are. Now, the other sites are all unknown at the start of the game. There's eight, level one, and four, level two. The difference between them is the level twos are more valuable and cost six compasses to get to. And, ad and additional travel cards. The, uh, th the level one compass, level one dig sites cost three compasses, and um, they have less rewards. You get to a site, you get to have um, a totem. This totem will have a little symbol printed on it that gives you a bonus on it that gives you a bonus. Then you'll flip it over. It's worth three points at the end. The further ones back. Uh, you get a second totem, but it's always face down, so you just get six points. You'll then draw a random tile from the set, put it on, take a guardian from the guardian pile, and that'll appear. So the, the dig site's worth X resources, but then there's a guardian There's a guardian of it, and the guardian's like, Hey, explorer, where's my cut? And they ask, you have to pay them resources. If you pay them resources, you earn their respect. 
and they'll give you a temporary one bonus by the end. Um, like some kind of like tax man, basically. They're like archaeological tax. It's the only way to, the only way to describe them. And you never know what you're going to have to pay. They're also worth five points. That's dig sites. These sites will be open and unlocked. The downside of failing to pay a guardian is at the end of the round, when you take your archaeological archaeologist back if you've not placated the guardian and removed the tile from the board you're going to get a fear card get a fear card and this is like getting an exhaustion card in flamme rouge it sucks you've got a six card deck getting a card that does nothing but give you minus one point at the end of the game and one footfall is bad like it's a huge penalty um way bigger than you would think when you first start because of the impacts it has so there's this little so there's this little reward for being a bit better prepared when you go to a dig site but you can't just rush in there and go okay well i can't manage the guardian i guess i'll deal with this card that i might get rid of a bit later kind of fun but still they, they are basically archaeological taxmen the uh, the uh second area is the where you acquire cards uh initially there's one artifact card four items artifacts are gained by spending compasses because as I mentioned, these archaeologists just throw compasses away all the time. Uh, yeah, and they I, use it like a sonar. Yeah, it's like, oop, the, <laughs> yeah, it's like, oop, the, yeah, exactly. <laughs> they, they chuck them like ender eyes in Minecraft, just use them to navigate. Where did that compass land? Head that way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, items are paid for with coins. Mechanically, they're very similar. You get a card into your deck. It's worth a number of points at the end of the game. You can play it in the future for its travel cost. Into your deck, it's worth a number of points at the end of the game. You can play it in the future for its travel cost to get to new sites or for its ability. The difference is artifacts, when you buy them, give you an immediate bonus. So you get this, just this card does this and you do it straight away. If you draw that and you want to do it in the future, you've got to discard a tablet, discard a tablet resource to activate it. Otherwise, they are very similar. The mix of the game is interesting because as time passes, the you'll be moving this magic staff across a round tracker in between the card slots. It kicks out cards and increases the number of artifacts in the tr in the line. So by the end of the game, you'll have four artifacts to choose from, more and more artifacts being found, and having less and less of your original gear available. I will say personally, I love the items the most because there's a dog and a parrot. Not biased. The doggo is wonderful and the parrot steals you gems. What about the cat? I don't know if there's a cat. I, I will be completely... Well, I mean, that makes sense. The cat's like gimme stuff. Gimme, gimme, gimme. <laughs> My mum's a huge cat person. She uh, did, I, did I mention before she's gotten a new kitten? Yeah, in Calico. Mm. A calico, um, yeah, yeah. My mom's new kitten Poppy is a calico. Yeah, actually. Yeah. Uh, when we talked about calico, you said, well, she adopted a, a, a the runt of a litter. So, yeah. Uh, right. Third board area. It's like a um, a a track you walk up. Uh, you have choices on which direction you go. You have to pay resources to go to the next level. The interesting portion of this is you have two pieces that you move. You move your magnifying glass first, magnifying glass first, and your book will follow, and you have to pay separately to move them all the way up. Um, you cannot ever move your book above your magnifying glass, representing that you have to do the investigation research before you can write it down in your book. There are different rewards for going up each tier. This track basically gives you one-off bonuses, um, points at the, end of the, at the end of the game, and is how you unlock your research assistants on the bird side of the board that's where you get them on the snake side you represent later expeditions you have to rescue one of your assistants they've got themselves in a bit of trouble they've been abandoned by a previous expedition uh, you know gotta wonder um check games edition have established and agreed that, well with basically said hey uh yeah this this portion of the board is a bit superfluous because it's where you just put resources and tiles it's not even it's cut off it's a separate part so you don't have to put it out if you don't want to um and to be honest downsides of this game um space is a major problem with it um so yeah and last of all you have your own player board it's just a place to keep your deck and your assistance but it has a really neat mechanic where you've got four spaces on your board and they're worth one two three if you leave them open for the whole game ooh, you get those points extra that's 10 bonus points 
but if you take one of the idols you've collected and put it over a spot you lose the points but you get a quick boost a temporary like injection of bonuses kind of like you've taken the idol and maybe traded it away instead of giving it to a mu- giving it to a museum or something or to whoever would own his culture you know let's not think too much about they belong in a museum (laughs) yeah who knows but you know enjoy the gems or the coins or the compasses as you want uh so i like that mechanic where you start with this effectively like here's this bonus of 10 points but you can get yourself little bonus of 10 points but you can get yourself little boosts to your engine to help you move faster and do things more often at the cost of those points it almost feels like a loan system the only other thing to note is that this is a deck drafting game. You'll have six cards to start with. They're identical. They're two fear cards and four other cards for each player. For each player, And you will gradually build on those. All new cards gained, plus the cards you played, go on the bottom of the deck, shuffled, and then you will draw again. So you tend to cycle through the same cards a lot. It's um, pretty exciting because you know normally when you buy a card, you'll get to use it the following turn. And there we uh, but, but what I found really interesting uh, but, but what I found really interesting, like when you find find those artifacts, I think uh, they you can use them immediately. They go to your, to your hand, right? Uh, do you you get to use the ability on them immediately? Yes. Yep, yep. That's one of the small things I found like really cool. Yeah, it's the uh, benefit. Yeah, it's the uh, benefit for get because you have to spend compasses to get them, uh, which you also spend to go to dig sites. So there's a bit of a cost, and that's your benefit, a little bonus. Yeah, I actually liked a lot the the way the deck building part is constructed because, uh, well, I, I negative consequences expressed as cards. So I, I actually like the fear cards and the fact that when you have fear, you can still use it to move away. So that's uh, that's cool. And also the, the fact that cards have double effects, like you can play them for traveling or for their effect, that is a winning move in this kind of game. Game. but I, I actually uh, is my I have to say that I still didn't have the chance to play but I read the rules carefully because I'm actually very interested in this game uh, is the worker placement part a bit weak am I wrong um you have a very limited number of worker placements effectively you've got 10 um and occasionally an artifact might manage to let you squeeze one or two extra out here or there. But uh, I, I don't think it's weak. I, I just think it's beca- it's it's a bit truncated. It, it ends. But yeah. I found, unlike Hansa Teutonica, where you go, ooh, ooh, I should have done this, I should have done that, I could have done this. Uh, when when um, Anak is over, it, you feel a little bit more like, oh, I, I didn't even get to the interesting part. Um, and you spend a lot of your time reacting to what the game is doing, rather than what the game is doing, rather than planning a strategy. Yeah, th- there's a bit of randomness uh, in that you c- you could uh, you could uh, play everything good and still be unlucky with the guardians or with the sites you get at random and have a bad game. Yeah, yeah, it's very reactive. At random and have a bad game. Yeah. Yeah, it's very reactive. I, I've, I've had games where I've gone in and I've been like, I want to do an artifact strategy this time, and I've gotten almost no compasses, and it's just not been possible to get in on them. So I've had to do items or work on my um, research. And it's good you've got lots of different areas getting into any one of them in, in depth and detail. And for me, personally, um, it's a bit dissatisfying at the end. Yeah, I think that's something I, I would be frustrated with. Yeah. Uh, I actually think that this game is good f- for introducing new people because it's pretty it's very simple. Uh, I think that the, the the bad part about it is that it uh, is a bit expensive for the yeah. experience. We were going to get into that. That was what I was leaving for yeah. the end. Um, but, uh, oh, spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we, we may as well move to it now, seeing as I've talked, I've talked mostly about the, the game and how it works. And here comes down to the, the rub of it. So for me, this game, as you've said, it's too expensive. It's too large. The board is... It's glorious. It's beautiful. But every single thing on the board is about... Everything on the board is about at least 50% 
too large like twice as big as it needs to be sometimes even three times as big the guardian tiles are 80 percent a picture and they're huge and the dig tiles are the same so i have a large table i have a large table for playing kingdom i have a large table for playing kingdom death for playing eclipse for playing twilight imperium or aliens um another glorious day in the core this thing eats up as much space as most of those games do um but uh, it, there's so much on there that i'm like this this isn't doing anything I, i'm there's not no justification for yeah, the space I, i'm there's not... no justification for yeah, the space yeah it's it's huge i don't mind that they have a board where the resources go but to be honest i'd have preferred they gave some bowls or something or let us find our own solutions um i don't mind that they have places for the decks of cards to go but again there's no need for it um the the no need for it um the the you, they could just be sat at the top they've even given you marked spaces for the discard piles so you feel very bound in where you're gonna be putting everything the track on the side you go up the little investigative track as neat as it is it's again about 50 percent just dead space and it's not artwork space there it's just like bits like bits of stone drawn on um which it just if you got the table for it it's fantastic but this game it's it's big to operate. It's it takes a long time to set up, and I feel like it's massively overproduced. It's like buying a chocolate bar for a snack and paying for a full price snack and paying for a full priced three course meal. It, it it's you know and and also it's not satisfying. It's not like you bite into this and at the end of it you're like like playing um, Thebes. You're like oh that was a really juicy satisfying rump of a game. That was meaty. This is like hmm okay this is a nice appetizer i could see nice appetizer i could see playing this at the start of the night but it's not the main course um and and we're talking about a game that is 600 to 700 krona like 60 70 euros whereas if it was 30 to 40 euros in a square box i would be saying get this i would be recommend this i would be recommending it in a heartbeat but at the price it is I don't think it's correctly weighted. It's um, it's like a two out of five for complexity and strategy. And even when I look at people who love it, when they talk about expansions, they're constantly talking about getting more of the same. Like I want more option. I want more options. I want more cards. I want more different dig sites. I want different routes to take on the research. Um, and it feels like everybody's like, I like the mechanics. I like what's going on here, but it's not satisfying me. Um, and I've, I've started to see people who say, I bought this, I love it, um, but nobody in my groups wants to play it with me, to play it with me. So most of the reason I wanted to talk about this was to say, hey, this is a good game, but the hype is pushing it above where it needs to be. I love Czech Games Edition. I, I, they did they did Galaxy Trucker. Every interaction I've had with them has been fantastic. And I think the designers of this game, are, of this game are, seem like two really wonderful people. And they've made something great. But it's been overproduced. It's just excess. Uh, and it's excess in every way it doesn't need to be. So possibly this is a good game, but wait for a discount. Wait for a discount or maybe hopefully check games. That game is the box is packed. And the same with Galaxy Trucker. You can barely fit everything in it. This one, uh, I've shown you guys photos of it. Um, most of what's in there is is because of plastic bags. And if I put a proper insert in there instead of space, it would just be taking up a, a lot of a lot of room for, for no real... Dune Imperium, I am a Fra Frank Herbert fan, but uh, basically it is marketed as a worker placement and deck builder just like this, but with no randomness. I really want to see how they compare. Yeah, people have been talking about both of those in the same breadth. Um, and I, from what I've seen, I, I think like Dune Imperium may be more up my street and definitely more within what I think is a reasonable price for the experience. But I'm not oh. a fan of Dune. Kind, yeah, of, the... kind of thought the first half of the first book was okay and then read wikipedia articles for all the rest and went glad i didn't read any of that oh, if you if you survive emperor Go that... if you if you survive emperor god of dune you can read everything <laughs> i survived imperial god of dune when i was 13 and that was too early and when i opened uh, in french it's the um, house of the mothers i don't know which one about the benegisiri and i was done with it <laughs> Yeah, actually. I don't know which one about the Benegisserit, and I was done with it. 
Yeah, actually, <laughs> fifth and sixth book uh, are still great, but the fourth book is a uh, is a bit on the boring side. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, let's not get off into Dune. I'm sure we'll talk about this at some point because uh, the actual you know Dune board game itself is. Fa- uh, I think that's all we have to say really on Vosrun's Varnak, unless everyone has any tidbits or trivia. Yes, I do have something to say about it. The game is coming in France in a few months. I think it's for April, I'm not sure. And it's been renamed in French because Arnac, uh, which in French is said Arnac, which is <laughs> for scam. So I think they didn't really like that and they decided to rename the game. And so in French it's Les Ruines Perdues de Narak. Oh my they God. just switched the N position. It's to an make anagram. It so. Less, uh, <laughs> So, so, so it would be the lost ruins of scum. Scum. <laughs> scum. scum. Oh my goodness! So you're just digging through like an old pyramid scheme to try and figure out what's going on. I mean, it's still got pyramids. <laughs> oh, wonderful. no! Like a scam, like when you send money on the yeah. internet and it's a yeah, fake. yeah, yeah, like a pyramid scheme. Yeah, like a pyramid scheme yeah. is one of those. Yeah, or a pyramid, ah, like... pyramid scheme. Yeah, yes, okay. Yeah. I, I thought py- pyramid. Why, why yeah. does it have to? It's do it's like that. <laughs> so the way there's Koch Ferratu, which is a vampire. Really. Coach Ferratu, do you want to get caught? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, we're going to stay on theme for exploration and journeying now with a look at uh, a heck of a smash hit from Sirius Pulp. Uh, yeah, back in France. Uh, yes, back in France again. Uh, <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Um, so The Seventh Continent is a narrative uh, exploration game with a stronger th- emphasis on uh, push your luck mechanics where you play as a 19th century explorer with a sort of um, Joel Verne meets Indiana Jones vibe. Uh, your character was part of an expedition on the brand new uh, mysterious seventh continent, but after their return, they realized that they've been cursed and need to go back to lift uh, said curse. Um, concretely, each curse is a narrative uh, arc that the player can go through. And they they can all be uh, mixed and matched, uh, although some of them mix better than other, and some of them uh, really do not mix with other curses, uh, which gives you a hint on what region to explore and will change some of the parameters of the um, uh, of the adventures that you'll go through to explore and will change some of the parameters of the um, uh, of the adventures that you'll go through. Uh, and as you go through your your basically trying to lift the curse, so you'll get some hints on on where to go and stuff like that. Uh, The way that the game plays is very clever, but in some way also limits stuff like that. Uh, The way that the game plays is very clever, but in some way also limits it. It entirely works with uh, numbered square cards. They are quite big, like uh, big like coasters. Um, Seven by seven centimeters. (laughs) Uh, reveal it in a beautiful top-down art. The action that you take are going to require you to draw specific cards uh, like a choose your own adventure book. Uh, to take an action, you need to do a push your luck and decide how many cards uh, of your deck you're going to draw. Um, given that if you exhaust uh, that deck, if you uh, put yourself in danger and have a chance to lose the adventure. Um, the card aspect is really fun, and I think that it's uh, a big part of the novelty of the game, but it also limits it in some small ways because some of the some of the aspects of the game might have been uh, handled better with just a dial for, or with just uh, some notes in a notebook or with something different. Uh, not, not saying that it makes the game feel lesser, just that... Um, it feels like it, it restricts the design in some ways here and there. Um, for a long time, it feels like it, it restricts the design in some ways here and there. Um, for a long time, the game was extremely rare and hard to get because it got a first extremely successful Kickstarter and a second one, and they basically decided to only print enough for the Kickstarter and to uh, they basically decided to only print enough for the kickstarter and to um you know and everybody that got interested after the fact and heard about the game were kind of left in the cold and were told oh this game is really really good it's amazing 
can you get it? No, you can't. They only printed like uh, 5,000 copies. And if you want one, you need to like buy it uh, off scalpers that are selling it for twice the price. Oh, well. Um, later one, thankfully, they've done, they've done reprints. And I think that the game is um, widely available now. Yeah. Except some expansions. I was going to say the um, the Swamp one, which is generally what I speak to, is impossible yeah. to get. The Swamp of Madness is great. The I think that the the different expansions are all fun, but uh, the base game definitely has a lot of content, and um, you know, yeah, you don't need to feel FOMO and like need to get everything. Uh, it's fun. Uh, the the base game is already like a, a lot of um, uh, fun to go through. Uh, so what's everybody's experience with it? I think that most of us played it and uh, and had fun with it. Uh, I know that me and uh, Audrey already did uh, a small campaign together. I think the base one, um, the, the Angry Goddess. Yeah, you helped us uh, get unlocked uh, on it. Ha <laughs> ha! Unlocked! Ha! <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I bought it second hand from a friend which got it at the second Kickstarter. It was an old in and poor guy got it. He, I really liked it, especially one thing that uh, Sirius Pulp did uh, on the second Kickstarter. I really enjoyed it's that, um, well, I wasn't following, but I got to, uh, let's say, uh, reap the successes out of it. It's that they had they discovered that some of the cards were misprinted for box, and it was a switch on the um, a, a small uh, ah. you yeah, you a could small, tell uh, you could tell the, the card decalage, yeah. uh, the coloration of the blue back of the cards, yeah. Yeah, it was it was nothing that prevented from playing. It was mostly and they reprinted for every single player the whole core game and send it without asking anything and i think that's really a good policy yeah actually uh it it was not important if you played drawing from bottom of the deck but since all the courses were discolored uh, a few other cards it actually had a bit of impact in the game if you learn to recognize the cards by the back uh, in this game when you exhaust the deck and when you draw a curse card from the discard pile you are dead so it is important that uh, this that the curse card is not recognizable otherwise you will always know when you're about to die i think i'm the only one who hasn't uh, played uh, seventh continent yet <clears throat> <laughs> I think, uh, I, but I think I might pick that up because I was like so busy with Kingdom Death, but now I have both the time and space for it. And, <laughs> so, and now you have lots of money. <laughs> but now I have both the time and space for it. And, <laughs> so, and now you have lots of money. <laughs> <laughs> so I might pick that up because I'm looking for a cooperative game with my wife. So that might be a good pick, I think. What yeah. Yeah. I think it's it's a pretty good pick, although the um, the Corpel at uh, yeah, uh, I think it's it's a pretty good pick, although the um, the Corpel at uh, aspect, um, I think with two people it's really good. Uh, above that, it starts getting a bit redundant. Yeah. You don't need that many people around the, the table to to look at the cards and search through them. But I think that having two people helps to uh, really lessen the the burden and the exhaustion that you can get from like uh, uh, searching through the cards to find the one that you you need to to get uh, to get into. S speaking of mechanics, uh, Fen, how did you uh, how did you find your approach to the game? I know that you've played it recently. Came into it a bit later than everyone else, and I'm probably going to be playing devil's advocate in here. I just want to like preface that first by saying it is a good game it is something you should get and something you should play but there are you do need to be aware that there are some it, it's not perfect um and i had For i sure. had some things that i found very fine um it, it, some people may enjoy that but it's like we're part way through a curse and we have been part way through a curse for like two weeks now and I've not been back onto it. Uh, is it the Forest's God? Yeah, so no, 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 it isn't. Yeah. Um, oh, the first thing okay. I did was I I did my research and I read that the Voracious Goddess did was I I did my research and I read that the Voracious Goddess was thirty odd hours. It could be twenty thirty hours to play through. And I was like, I'm not doing that. No, no, no. That's the kind of thing I think your last campaign thing should be. I don't think it should be what the base game is. So we played. Um, 
what goes up first of all i think that's the intro it, no that, no um what goes up first of all i think that's the intro it, no no what good no sorry really not what good. goes up the crystal song the crystal song oh, the, crystal the intro song. quest okay. Which was fine. We got a little bit of a wander around of the map, explored, came back and got a final score. Uh, and then we tried some of the other shorter scenarios as well. We tried some of the other shorter scenarios as well. Um, and th- that was that's my first complaint is I I would not be wanting to play the the voracious goddess in full. Um, it's the same problem I have with Kingdom Death. I I think if you're going to release your game, have a short a, a one session or few session campaign and then a big proper one in it as well just because it's hard to sit down with a bunch of people and say all right we're going to be playing this for the next month um yeah it's yeah. a huge barrier <laughs> and this is a game as well that, that that was what was fun about the crystal song was um just dip it and knowing we got a certain amount of time once it's up we're just going to come back and that's that i also find having to go forage for food just detracts from the enjoyment of exploring um i, I really hate it that's that's a common complaint yes yeah that's a complaint that pretty much everybody had about the, the get into the way of the the play yeah. and the fun of it. Survival mechanics are fun in a game that is like one, two sessions yeah. long. When you've been doing survival mechanics for 10, 15 hours. Ugh. Yeah, I, I could say that about uh, other survival games uh, <laughs> when there is, in my opinion, should not prevent from enjoying the narrative element. There should be at, at least some alternative rules for a story game, a story mode. At least. Yeah, or, yeah, or even like checkpoints or way to not just lose uh, 10 hours of process that you are going to go through and re- go through this exact same exploration variant, which is done uh, exactly for this purpose, which is rather good. I, I have to say, uh, without the survival mechanism, probably this game will feel a bit less tight and it could be detrimental. It's also true that you die you quickly uh, behind every corner and that's frustrating a bit for example when you enter a cave section you have to be super stacked on food or you will starve in that cave yeah it's it's not that, that there needs to be a mechanic for a time and there needs to be some kind of risk i just don't think this is that there needs to be a mechanic for a time and there needs to be some kind of risk i just don't think this is the right mechanic i think they needed something else um, yeah, yeah. So, something that fill, fits the the length and the way that uh, the game is approached. Yeah. Um, there, there's been a lot of uh, fan rules that um, that um, there, there's been a lot of uh, fan rules that um, that play on that and do some uh, some stuff that uh, I, I've tried a couple that really make it feel uh, still gripping, but you you don't feel like you're going to. Um, you don't feel tired by the... the yeah, the... To, to, to be honest, if you start the game in easy mode with the idol which lets you die once and replenish your deck, it is a lot more forgiving. I think uh, I played Voracious Goddess for the first time in easy mode. I used the idol and that saved me, I, I think, the hours, I think it saved me 10 hours of play, so that, that's uh, a way to enjoy the game. The exploration mod, which comes in what's up, what goes up uh, must come down, it's also a good way to play to play this game just for the exploration part because the exploration part is excellent. That's the thing. Excellent. That's the thing. Are, yeah. The, but the best yeah. part of this is the exploration and the puzzles. And yeah, the, the, yeah. The, the the survival stuff is getting in the way in in not... and the comfort creatures when you get them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I uh, also um this this is very much like a card expression of the old fighting fantasy games. The old choose your so um. This, this is very much like a card expression of the old fighting fantasy games, the old choose your own adventures. I feel like they've kept an artifact from that, which is they. The, I, I don't see the point in like cards one, two, three, fifty, and so on that are like the same every mission. Uh, um, the wound cards, the like the same every mission. Uh, um, the wound cards, the this is the book cards. I feel like they should have just been decks labeled as such and kept out because. 
it, it, the first time you play, you go, ooh, I'm at a point and I'm going to do something and I draw an 0-1 card. And you're like, well, that's probably going to be some kind of small animal as a food, but I'm not sure. You're iteratively replaying it with new curses. And I just reached a point where I have a little dashboard now I set out and all of those decks, I whip them out from the various binders and lay them out just to save on time. Because it's like, oh, we just, you know, oh, 03, that's experience. Uh, 50, that's, that's a journal entry. And it just feels like they've first thinking about what it's like when replaying. I don't need um, a special hidden away poison section because eventually I'm going to learn what the poison cards are, etc. And I, I feel like that that's adding a lot to the game. And for me, it was tiring until I stripped all of those decks out and just put them on the table all the time. When you when you start to learn that you get tired, if you get a 103 card, I don't know, it's a bit a bit it's been a while since I played. So when you get a 100 or something card, you you will get a negative status. So you know that there's a negative consequence. But it uh, is also true that the status cards are a bit different from each other on the same kind of card because they can be removed for example injured you could uh, some cards will force you to discard some other don't some cards will be removed with uh, an healing action and some other cards will be removed just by by resting yeah so what the, what fan is saying is uh, i have a separate yeah, deck, yeah. Just i'm not, not saying get rid of the thing lost I'm just in the yeah. middle of the hundreds of cards that, that you need to turn yeah through. or just have two cans and a reference card well the decks as alessio is saying the decks are fine because they the wound got some poisons just poison um and yeah so uh, that's that's what i was saying was just it, it's just worth Worked better since I've I've physically stripped those decks away. I, I everything else I think is fine. That it should all be like different numbers, and you're not sure where you're going, and it's not all linked together in a, a fashion. But yeah, it's uh, those cards. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Th there's no there's no reason, for example, to have experience cards except for the small stories, which the first time you read them, uh, they are cool. Oh, I, I'd be happy with an experience deck. You know, just so, just yeah. as experience on it has the little cool stories. Every card could be the same. Yeah, yeah, fine. But um, you know, on it has the little cool stories. Every card could be the same. Yeah, yeah, fine. But um, you know, it it's a thing. The the other one, and I'm gonna warn this especially for David, who I know likes to collect bling. Um, the neoprene map and the self draw map notebook suck. Self draw map notebook suck right oh. okay <laughs> so <laughs> the, the, the neoprene map is a seven by seven map um and it's too small i've run off the edge of it on numerous occasions it's not wide enough and that is frustrating uh, the continent is 11 by 11 and uh, that so it, the whole continent doesn't even fit in there sure you're not always going to explore the whole continent. That's just a given. But to, to consistently, like I have islands sitting off the side, off the edge of the map, and it's like, uh, why couldn't it have at least been 11 by 11 or been 11 by 7 or something better? And it's the same with Sabad, so because you, if you draw on them, you can do multiple pages with bits and pieces. But it's just, why is it? Why have you cut off those extra four spaces on either side? Also, and I'm not the only person who has this problem. They supply the neoprene map in a box. It's folded instead of rolled. It has a line, an iron out. I cannot get rid of it. This neoprene is like the same stuff you make swimsuits from, okay? When it gets folded that badly, it takes it forever. So Yeah, that, that was another common complaint. <laughs> uh, a last of all, a small one. I don't like the new box. It's too small. I, I keep looking at the cla the the black like the new box is too small. I, I, I keep looking at the cla the the black box and I'm like I wish I had that not these brown. I have to run two brown boxes, so that's. I extra. bought an extra uh, box for storage uh, to put everything inside because I I sleeve my cards. I sleeve everything uh, to put everything inside because I I sleeve my cards. I sleeve everything. And when the cards were sleeved and I was trying to fish for a card on the box, there was tight enough that I was hurting my fingers on the sleeves. Uh, I would have had to sleeve the cards from the size, from the side, sorry. And uh, I've only sleeved the um, the skill deck. 
uh, and we, that's the action deck. The action yeah. deck, yeah, yeah. That's all. Everything else I haven't bothered sleeving. But I uh, probably, if we'd have had separate decks from the start for the conditions, I might have sleeved those as well. Um, as yeah. Speaking of bling, uh, with um, yeah, I've got that. It's really good. Yeah, the journal cards can like fit inside it and turn into like uh, the page of a book. That one works really mm-hmm. well. Looks great. Uh, I think that that's the best blink of the game and um, uh, so, something that I would recommend to get. Uh, I agree. The, the person I bought it from had gotten the, the, the yeah. notebook and yeah, it's great. I don't like the bone um, dice. They're, they're not very good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, nobody liked the bone dice. This is the third com- common complaint. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of the, the mechanics of the game that can be uh, quite... <laughs> um, Speaking of the the mechanics of the game that can be uh, quite tiring, um, it seems like Serious Pulp really listened to what people said. And in the next game, uh, Seventh Citadel, they've cut down a lot of the the fat uh, of the mechanics. For example, like the the partial fat uh, of the mechanics. For example, like the the partial luck mechanics are in themselves tight and can lead to some really fun gameplay but they have a little bit uh, a, a little bit too many steps sometimes where you have to remember like the effects of uh so and so that can uh that can play in how you they've also uh added a sort of um side uh choose your own adventure book where you can uh quote unquote have dialogues with characters and um and thing and so overall i think that seven citadel is going to be the better game when it, uh, maybe it's worth waiting another six months yeah ac- actually seven citadel is a very interesting project there's a lot of announcement of the rules the, the only thing that I, th- I think it could be weak is exactly the dialogue book it depends on how it's written and played but hopefully it's good so it's an interesting it depends on how it's written and played but hopefully it's good so it's an interesting thing and we will talk about it of, of, of for, for sure yeah it's interesting enough and sent continent was good enough that i have jumped in on Seventh Citadel to see how it goes. Haha. <laughs> it seems like your bird is having quite a fuss behind you, Fen. Seventh Citadel to see how it goes. Haha. <laughs> it seems like your bird is having quite a fuss behind you, Fen. <laughs> it's uh, it's Nimbus. Uh, he's he's in a timeout in a separate cage because he attacked Merkel. He's going through adolescence. He's having a rough time. But uh, let's not talk about that because this is all we have time. All we have time for this episode. You can catch us over at www.patreon.com forward slash the last standee or as the last standee on Twitter. Uh, and until next time, we have been the last standee. So goodbye from Alexis. Uh, from Belgium. Au revoir. Alessio. Bye bye from Italy. And remember, the second Ian standee is for exploration. Thank you.